Hello, everybody. After the summer, we are trying to start again with uh, medieval Hebrew poetry. Um, and uh, I hope we'll pick up uh, the uh, attendance a bit, but um, people are dripping in, so this is wonderful. Um, so I'm going to go quickly over a few things that we discussed last time uh, and then pick it up from there. We spoke about Hazda ibn Shabrut. He was a very uh, important figure, uh, very influential, because he lived, he, um, he was, um, he, he, first of all, let me say, he lived what we call the, 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 the height, so to say, the summit the, 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 of the golden, Jewish golden age in Spain. Now, Spanish uh, Spain, at least the south, the, the, at that point, the biggest part of Spain was under Muslim rule. Uh, it was under um, a old dynasty that had once upon a time uh, ruled the entire Muslim world, that and it was called the Omayyad uh, dynasty. But they had been chased away by a new dynasty called the Abbasids, and they had found refuge in uh, in Spain, and that was their holdout. In the beginning, the Umayyads were quite brutal, uh, but um, I think they got uh, Spain, uh, the atmosphere of Spain got into their brain. They, they got influenced by Spain, I guess. They, they changed over time, became more kind of worldly, although they were worldly in the beginning, just they became maybe less brutal, although they had some brutal treats. We might actually see that. But... They, they, they wanted their little mini uh, caliphate, so to say, or um, to, uh, to flourish in many ways, not just uh, Islamically for the Islamic population, but for every, everyone. They really felt that they uh, should be the, 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 um, the center of the world in terms of culture, in terms of economy, etc. So, so this ruler, Abdurrahman III, who ruled quite uh, a while, uh, what is it, 55, no, no, yeah, 55 years, uh, from 1915 to 970, that is quite a while, that is a sta very stable for the olden days. People used to be assassinated or, 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 or killed uh, way before that. Um, so there was a stability, but he also was proud to, to, to have the Jewish community flourish there. Now, what happened is, he found Hazai ibn Shaprut as his uh, personal doctor. And um, personal doctors were uh, like, say, life coaches. This is not just he had to uh, check on, on, the, on the caliph. Or first he was Amir, and then he was, called himself caliph. And on the harem, and on his uh, officials, and, and anyone uh, on their health. But also, of course... You, he, if, you, if you talk to your doctor every day, he becomes like a confidant, right? He becomes become saying, well, I have some problems. What do you think, doctor? And he's going to say, I would do A, B, or C. And um, Abdul Rahman thought that Hazai was quite smart. And he, and he was very uh, educated and, and, and also had bright insights. So he started using him as his personal advisor. Eventually, he became practically the second person, the person behind the throne. He took up a lot of responsibilities for uh, Abdul Rahman and uh, to the point that he was basically his, his main uh, minister, even though he couldn't have the title because under Islamic uh, law, officially, you couldn't place a non-Muslim above a Muslim. So he was, let's say, the prime minister without a title. He was just the advisor, but in, in, in okay. So we go to the next page. Hasdai then, uh, being close to the throne, having influence, was also able to stimulate Jewish culture. And yeah, with the, with the support of Abdurrahman. So he also promoted Talmudic studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he promoted Talmudic studies. He promoted also studies of the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language, you think, well, what is there to study about the Hebrew language? The language is known for hundreds of years. But people now had new insights in grammar. Um, and that was because Arabic grammar had become very important. Um, you know, this is all to do with, uh, with, with, with Islam. Actually, 
from the rise of Islam, we have some, we, 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 we are, uh, we, we are, can be thankful in some ways for the rise of Islam because Islam had some problems to solve that then helped the Jewish, uh, Jewish science, so to say. What was the issue? I don't know if I can elaborate on it a bit, but maybe I can never help myself anyway, so I will. In terms of, um, <laughs> in terms of uh, Islam, Islam was, of course, they have a, a prophet uh, that they believe in Muhammad, and Muhammad supposedly got revelations from through the angel Gabriel that he uh, that he then started um, or orating or like an oracle verses, like verses in Arabic from the Quran that people then would memorize and repeat and repeat so everybody would know it. Now, uh, soon after Muhammad died, or even before, people started writing things down because it was became too much uh, for everybody to remember. Um, so, but the Arabic alphabet had not been developed yet. So there were very rudimentary letters and you can have five letters that had the same shape. So they started differentiating letters with dots. So a dot below is a B, a dot on top is an N and that's, that's how they did that. But then also what's the pronunciation? So they start thinking we have to put vowels there now. They go to different tribes in the Arab Peninsula, in, in Arabia, different tribes of different pronunciation. Now the grammarians say, what is the correct pronunciation? And they start comparing uh, 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 pronunciations and not saying, oh, this has been in Judaism. In Judaism, it has been that um, people say, oh, what is the tradition? How did we hear it from our teachers? And that's written down. Or that is memorized in the beginning. There were no when there were no vowels and passed on. No, they started doing it from a different way. They start saying what what makes sense. Let's say if if in certain cases in the past tense there's always I did, I worked, I wrote, I I I, I walked, I smurfed, whatever. It's always ah uh, ah. Uh. Let's say oh ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. Uh, I did faala. I wrote kataba. So if then there is another verb that says uh, kutaba or kotaba, then, then they might say, well, that doesn't make sense. It's probably a mistake. So they would iron the things out. They would discover first grammatical patterns and then apply the, 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 the vocalization based on the regularity in, of grammar, uh, the predictability of grammar. Grammar has to be somehow, there's a rule in grammar. Now, so in, in Judaism, we had a long tradition of how we pronounce things without the rules of grammar. Now we have grammarians who, who know Arabic grammar and who start saying, um, you know what, we want to know if Hebrew has similar rules and based and because they are it's Hebrew is similar a lot of these patterns work very very similarly the only thing is we have a lot more irregularities because there is a, a different um, order the Arabs first the Muslims first the, the detected grammatical rules and then apply their pronunciation based on the rules we first have the pronunciation and try to detect the rules based on our tradition. So therefore, a lot of more irregularities have crept in and therefore um, we have more irregularities. But basically the grammar is similar and also based on uh, the vocalization, uh, perhaps also inspired by Muslims who wrote down the vocalization. That's around the same time that Jews really start making a, a, an effort to design a vocalization based uh, uh, for the Torah text and for the, the, the biblical text. It's around the same period of time. Is it because of uh, inspired by Islam or is it the same zeitgeist, the same, the same trend that's ha happening uh, to, to, to religions at the same time? Who knows? I don't know that. You, you know the difference, right? So two things could happen at this parallel to each other without necessarily influencing one or the other. They might be just part of the same, the same trend, the same zeitgeist. Or 
there might be, but they, they, I'm sure that Jews have looked at, uh, at what's happening in Islam because they knew what was going on. And then we also designed, um, of course, uh, uh, almost at the same time, signs for the melodies or to read the Torah and the texts. Okay, so here we are. We have, we didn't speak about him, but there was a person called Moshe ben Hanoch. And let me quickly uh, mention him. I probably did half a year ago, but we'll do it again. Moshe ben Hanoch was one of the prominent scholars of Babylonia. And um, we spoke about the, uh, in the time when we, when we discussed Saadi Gaon, we spoke about the Gaonim. So he was one of these, I don't know if he was a Gaon, he was not a Gaon, but he was a, a prominent a teacher in Babylonia. And um, he had been going through the, by the Mediterranean, <coughs> by boat, to different cities to try to raise money for the academies of Babylonia. And, however, on his trips, he was captured by pirates and um, Muslim pirates from Spain. Uh, unfortunately, something sad happened. The, uh, the, 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 the pirate captain raped his wife. She was very beautiful. And she drowned herself uh, in the sea out of desperation. And in any case, he comes, he's brought to, as, as, a, as a captive to Spain and he's sold on the slave market with his son. The Jewish community is always out there seeing, are there any slaves on the, on the market to be sold that are Jewish? Because then they make a big effort to raise the money and buy them off the uh, slave trader and give them their freedom back. And this happened to Moshe Hanbeh and and uh, I'm assuming to his son too. And so he is, he's, he, where are you from? From Babylonia. He goes to the Talmud Academy in Cordoba and he makes a, a huge impression. He knows much more than anyone else. And so, um, uh, so uh, Hasdai hears about it and appoints him, and that is this why he appoints him the head of the Talmud Academy. Now, the, um, the people in Spain, in Muslim Spain, uh, start thinking, wow, we have the, uh, one of the crown jewels of Babylonian teaching and learning in Cordoba now, everybody up that time who had serious questions about Jewish law or about what to do, even philosophy, would write to you know to uh, Saadia and to others to uh, to um, to Babylonia to the uh, to the academies of uh, originally Pumbedita and Pumbedita, now all both based in Baghdad. But why would we do that? We have now a great teacher next to us so we can so people from a big part of the world from started not writing letters to to baghdad and waiting for months or maybe half a year or if not longer for perhaps an answer if the letter doesn't get lost they go to cordoba so now cordoba is a center of babylonian learning as we may remember and i think i mentioned it before there were two had always been two main centers of uh, Torah and Talmud learning, Babylonia and the land of Israel. At that time, um, well, a certain, by scholars often used, uh, 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 called Palestine, Palestinian and Babylonian Judaism. Now, but um, for political reasons, maybe we nowadays want to say Babylonian and um, Holy Land uh, Judaism, whatever. Those two schools, uh, so the, the, the the the, the 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 learning in the Holy Land in um, in the land of Israel had been suffering for because they had much more um, uh, turmoil, so to say, also uh, more um, persecution and oppression that they weren't doing as well as the one in Cordoba, and and so people and and when both communities became ruled by Islam. Uh, both were part of the Arabic-speaking world. They spoke each other's languages. People from Babylonia would also move to Jerusalem, um, less uh, and and keep their own traditions. While if anyone from Jerusalem or from the land of Israel moved to Babylonia, uh, there were no academies there, so they uh, they they usually assimilated into Babylonian Judaism. So Babylonian Judaism was really uh, on the winning side. And now in Spain. 
there is an academy also based on Babylonian teachings and the Babylonian traditions. So Babylonian traditions uh, is, uh, is, is another blow for Jerusalem scholarship, um, and for land of Israel scholarship, one thing. Secondly, what did I want to say is, um, is that, um, th th as we know from Spain, um, is the cradle of uh, Sephardi Judaism. That's obvious, because Sephardi is the Spanish, uh, the Hebrew word for Spain and Portugal. So this also explains that Sephardi Judaism, I hear I have a, an interesting uh, slide. Sephardi Judaism, a scholarship, is all based on Babylonian Judaism, has hardly any influence from Palestinian scholarship. Um, so even though Moroccan, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, and uh, Iraqi, and all these are look very different, but they're all based on Babylonian Judaism, while the only uh, type of Judaism that has significant elements of, of the old scholarship of the Jerusalem Talmud is Ashkenazi. They have still Jerusalem uh, influence, basically. Uh, the Jerusalem Talmud, the, the, the scholarship of the land of Israel. So Spain became, this is the reason why Sephardi Judaism is, is almost purely based on Babylonian Judaism. All right, we'll go back. There's another, uh, after uh, Moshe ben Hanoch, we have Menachem ben Saruk, and he's a very important person because um, I don't know, I don't remember if I spoke about him, but I must have before the summer. Um, so he was somebody who was working on a huge project. The project he called the Mahberet, which I think in modern Hebrew just means a notebook. But um, it is, uh, it's, it's like, a, it's a dictionary, biblical Hebrew, but he wrote with every word, grammatical explanations, what the root is of the word and stuff. So it's very important. It's just like very, uh, yeah, how do you say, uh, breaking, um, breaking, uh, there's a term that I can't come up with, but he was, he's, he was really uh, pioneering uh, in, in terms of going through uh, grammar and applying it to, to words and explaining words in that way, which is, yeah, very useful. There was only one, one thing. Menachem ben Saruk um, was under the impression that every uh, word, or almost all, that all words in Hebrew go back to a root of two consonants. So I have here Beit and Gimel. But later, the next generation, the younger people who uh, looked and started comparing Hebrew to Arabic grammar and seeing that it works exactly as an Arabic, Arabic grammar, just like Hebrew, really has a root of three consonants, almost always. There are some exceptions. The word dumb, blood, has only two, uh, two consonants. For instance, the word ben, son, only two consonants. Um, uh, the word ben, between, has three consonants. It's bet, yud, nun, but ben is bet, nun. There are a few, uh, but, uh, but very few. Uh, min, from, two consonants only, but mean, uh, species, uh, has, has three. Now, um, in any case, this, is, uh, this, this was discovered, and so there was a whole, that became a, a cause, of, cause of great contention, uh, a, a, a fight for, for uh, over influence. People started mocking him, unfortunately, the new generation in a, in a not so um, respectful way. And so this was a, a big thing. But for now, we have Menachem Ben Saruk working because, you know, if you, if you start doing too many, uh, too much um, holy work, uh, you start working on projects that are, you think are important, it doesn't necessarily make money. Maybe later, but uh, often not. So you need a sponsor. I'm always looking for sponsors, by the way. Um, okay. So, <laughs> uh, so this is um, Menachem ben Saruk here. And, um, and so uh, Chazai ibn Shabrut said, you know what? I can afford it. You, you, uh, I'm going to give you housing. You can live in my house. I have an extra room. 
uh, and I'm going to pay for your board and for your for your clothing and for you. And you work on your project. It's important. I sponsor you. So he had a uh, he had a he had a, a wonderful sponsor, and that was very very <laughs> beautiful. The thing is that the later uh, uh, the scholars um, who discovered the three consonant system, which makes sense now. By the way, I have to before I end I end this question. Going back here, if you have two consonants, sometimes you see you have two uh, th uh, uh, a root letter of uh, three consonants, and you have another root letter of three consonants that seem uh, that that have two in common that seem um, relatable to each other. For instance, peresh. Uh, there is many roots, uh, verbs, and and words that have. Uh, that, that are different uh, root uh, set, uh, set, but peresh they have in common, and they also have a common uh, um, meaning. For instance, uh, para is to um, lifrot is to, um, to 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 multiply, right? To 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 pr procreate, which means splitting into more sections. Um, uh, Paratim are details. Uh, then you have uh, parats is to break through. It's also uh, related. Uh, you have um, uh, a split hoof is also paras. Uh, a hoof is, is, is also split. Um, and, and there's many words with, um, with, uh, uh, with peresh, but still grammatically they should be uh, treated as different roots based on the consonants, even though it could be that in antiquity there might have been two consonants that have spawned words with different three consonants. In any case, there's something to what Benachem Ben Saruk said, but most of the time this doesn't work. Um, what, what the, what's the thing is, oh yeah, I'm going back to my sentence. The, the, the problem is that, um, or the problem, or not the problem for Benachem Ben Saruk, but he wrote his scholarship in Hebrew. Uh, now, the other uh, generation, the new generation, who had studied Arabic grammar and came to the conclusion that Hebrew worked similarly, they um, wrote their scholarship in Arabic. So outside of the Arabic world, which was most of the Jews lived in the Arabic world, so they didn't really worry about it. But uh, later, this would be spread. Uh, this could not be spread to, let's say, the Ashkenazi world. So for that reason, let's say Rashi, in his commentary, he knew about Menachem ben Saruk's work, but he didn't know about the later uh, grammarian's work. So he often gives in his pirush, in his commentary, explanations of words based on the theory that there's a two uh, consonant root. And, and, and therefore, he makes uh, assumptions that are incorrect because he says if two, uh, two consonants are the same, then there is a connection, which is not often true, often not true. So, um, and, and uh, so, even even later, even uh, let's say um, Samson Raphael Hirsch, he he repeats these things too, and still uh, making drawing conclusions based on the idea of a two constant roots. I'll give you one example. I once heard a a, uh, a lecture of somebody talking about the Gid Hanashia, that is the, um, the 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 tendon that was struck on the hip of Jacob, the um, the twisted uh, tendon or nerve. So uh, the nerve, it's a nerve, uh, string of nerves. Now people would say Gid comes from, if it's a two uh, consonant root, then it is Gimel Dalet. And then they say it's the same as Magid, uh, speaking. Uh, and so because you pull, like a tendon pulls, and you pull somebody in when you speak. But this is a nice theory. It sounds very, very beautiful, but it's not true because the word Magid comes from Neged. Uh, mangid, uh, the noon is assimilated in the main. Mangid, so you're standing opposite someone and you have an, an, an interaction with a person, um, uh, like a dialogue. So that is basically, uh, you, for to be a Mangid, you need a, uh, an audience. So that is, you're standing naked at that audience, uh, opposite that audience. Um, so that is what the, 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 the root of that is. While Gid comes from Gimel da, uh, Yud Dalet, Mangid comes from Noon. Uh, so there are different roots. Also, uh, we saw a blossoming of Hebrew poetry. So this is also a reflection of the Arabic culture. Um, for Muslims, poetry 
is let's say listening to the beauty of the Arabic uh, Arabic uh, language. When you grow up <coughs> memorizing um, Quran texts by heart, and that's the ideal. In, in 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 the ideal in Islamic culture is to learn the entire Quran by heart. Um, and even though you might not understand it, still people I. I I know I've heard of people, uh, I've spoke to people from Pakistan, for instance, who, um, who knew the whole Quran by heart without understanding even a word or hardly a word. But that's not the point. The point is the beauty of the language. It sounds, sounds good. Uh, yeah, you can make Arabic sound really beautifully because you take your time and you, you, you make long vowels really long and short vowels short and you really hear, put an emphasis on doubling of consonants. In, I, I wish we could do that in Hebrew, and we can. The only thing is, we have um, we have a parasha to in the in the Torah that is um, too long to take our time for it. So often the trend became to just read it and get it over with. Because if you read it at the same pace as a Quran reader, it would take half a day to finish your parasha. So that's why we. Um, we, we lost that uh, that ability, in my opinion. That I think that's what it is. So m m uh, Jews are part of the same culture, and they say, "But our our language is just as beautiful." I mean, our language not is just as beautiful. Our language is the holy language, just like Arabic. Think that of of of, of Arabic. Um, our language is the holy language, and um, you know, we we they they they, they start doing the same thing. Um, of course, I cannot have a, a, an illustration of poetry, so I have an illustration of, uh, of of calligraphy, Hebrew calligraphy. Sure, that is not poetry, but calligraphy, uh, similar, right? People start developing and write. He, Arabic calligraphy is just amazing, so people start doing the same with Hebrew calligraphy too. Um, see, this is Arabic calligraphy, and here on the right is, is Hebrew call calligraphy. So, um, yeah, we get a new type of Hebrew poetry uh, based on classical Arabic poetry. How does that work? Um, I hope you don't mind if I explain this again. It's complicated enough to repeat it, even though somebody with a great brain might re remember it from last uh, class uh, so many months ago, much longer than I had anticipated. In Arabic poetry, a meter is not based on the on, on a pattern of um, emphasis on, on stress, let's say uh, bom and and the non-stress is ching, then is bom ching bom ching bom ching bom bom ching bom ching bom ching bom. That would be a, a very simple pattern in English. Mary had a little lamb, and everywhere she went, that that's a pattern of of of, of stresses and um, and unstressed uh, syllables. In Arabic meters, different. It's a pattern of long and short syllables. Now, now you have to know what a long syllable is and a short syllable. Hola, let's start with a short syllable. A short syllable is just a combination of a consonant and a vowel. Now, sim what makes it simple in Arabic is that you only have three vowels. In Hebrew, we have more vowels. You have an a, an u, and an e. So you can have la, lu, li. You, ya, ye, bi, ba, bu. So, but short. You also have long vowels, which is a, a, u, e. So, so people who pronounce the Arabic correctly will make a distinction between la and la, you and you, bi and bi. So there, there must be a big difference. So the short is just a consonant with a short vowel. That is, and it's also because it ends with a vowel. It's called an open syllable. Open means ending with a vowel. Now, a long syllable can be two things. It's mm. either the same, but with a long vowel. So instead of la, you, be, it would be la, you, be. See, and here under B, uh, you have A and B here. It could be a closed syllable. That means it is a combination, consonant, um, vowel, consonant. And then it doesn't matter if it's a long or short uh, vowel so lam yun or bil or yun it's all the same it ends with the consonant then it's considered a long syllable so you must have some 
different ears to recognize this because our ears are not really tuned, fine-tuned to this to really think, oh, what, the, what is this long or short vowel? We don't hear that pattern easily unless we really train ourselves. But a native speaker of Arabic who's gr who grew up with this will immediately recognize this. And there's even young children that are able to make little poems uh, just spontaneously uh, based on, on this pattern because it's so, so, it's so focused on this. Now, here are some, and every pattern has a name. Um, number one, it's called the Hazaj, that is just a short vowel, and three long ones, short, long, 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 short, long, 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 that is called Hazaj. But if you have short, long, long, short, long, short, long, long, that is a particular uh, uh, a pattern called Mudare. So everyone has a name, and yeah, you have to, I, I wouldn't, Hazaj I've seen so often because it's the most simplest, and mostly, it's the most simple one also for Hebrew alphabet. Now, why do I have seven, eight, nine, and 10 uh, in red? Because that doesn't exist. That's impossible to do in Hebrew poetry. Because why? First of all, um, at the end of the number seven, it's called the tawil, the long, there's two short uh, syllables. You can never have two short syllables in, in Hebrew. Uh, you can never have two syllable, uh, short, two short syllables next to each other. Also in eight, mutadarik, that doesn't exist. And the same happens in nine and ten. You have two short syllables next to each other. Never, never happens in Hebrew poetry, in Hebrew language. So you cannot do that. Okay, so now, hold on. So I made a hazaj myself uh, in, uh, in Arabic. Uh, in Arabic. And I wrote it with Hebrew letters here. Tanasakna bi uzlati wa asmatna bi da'wati wa lam nusal falam nu'i ila anzarana al muhi ta'allamna sa'adati. Well, in Hebrew, in English, it would be we became like hermit spies and detached. That would, uh, that would be that if you're too pious and you, um, you 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 want to focus only on spiritual pleasures. You have no, uh, you, you are detached from the world. You have no um, impulses, no uh, stimuli anymore. But our prayers grew silent and mute. So what are you going to pray about at the end when you there's nothing to pray when you don't have anything to talk about or to pray about? We became unreachable, unconscious. We just become uh, in a stupor. But He who restores life, that is God, came to us. Uh, um, God, God reached out, and we learned different kinds of happiness. Meaning, He opened the door, and we, we, um, we opened our horizon. In any case, it's probably nonsense, but I tried to make something deep. Okay, here. So, classical Arabic poetry has themes. Uh, a, a lot of it goes back to pre-Islamic times. You can have uh, Bedouin life in the desert. Tents and campgrounds, nature, love, compassion, even adultery is uh, is is praised in in poetry. Sometimes war and heroism is very uh, prevalent. Wine poetry, even though wine is forbidden, there's there's throughout the ages there's been wine poetry and about honor and about fate. Um, and we will now go and apply this to Hebrew poetry. This sim similar pat similar themes in Hebrew poetry. There's also love poetry, drinking songs, all these things. And what is really, uh, I think, unique for Hebrew poetry compared to Arabic is that Hebrew was not spoken for centuries, for many centuries. It was used as a scholarly language. It was used in, uh, in, in a language, uh, in, of course, studying the Bible. It was used in prayer, but not in day-to-day -day, uh secular life Arabic was so you had to for Hebrew you had to look for expressions and um, and and so the, the main source of inspiration for that would be the Bible to and so in Hebrew poetry what you see is um, basically constantly 
uh, quotes from the Bible, phrases from the Bible that are applied in a new way. And I think we're going to see that quite a bit if we continue this course. That, um, of course, the Song of Songs is really, if you want to do love songs, love poetry, you got, you got uh, something there that is full of juicy stuff. But, but also other stuff from the prophets and from the Torah, uh, people used to, especially the, Sephardi, the old Sephardi culture, people used to memorize texts, huge parts of texts that has not become, is, is not mainstream anymore uh, in, 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 in the Ashkenazi uh, model of studying. You, um, the, the ideal is to, to study and to dissect uh, Talmudic discussions and, and memorize the discussions, but there's very little, uh, much less emphasis on, on, on the Bible, let alone memorizing. That is not, that's not what happens. It's on, based on halakha and on Talmud. But the Sephardim would be focusing more on, a lot more on, on scripture. And people knew phrases left and right and would pour in their, would draw in their writing of poetry, uh, use whole, whole phrases. You would have poems that it, there's in in every line there's at least one phrase from a certain part of the Bible from different parts put together in a whole new context, therefore getting a whole new meaning. So uh, that that's really a, a typical thing. Now we go to Dunash Ibn Rab Labrat, and we spoke about him last time. That was the last thing we did. Dunash, um, as um, David told me before, and I was already uh, uh, I had already guessed it. But I didn't know for sure. Dunash was, uh, Ibn Labrat was um, born in Fez. I didn't know if there was Fez, but I could guess that he was from Morocco. Why? Because Dunash is actually, uh, and Labrat too, I think. There's, those are Berber names. Yeah. It's a Berber name. It's not uh, Hebrew or even Arabic. Um, but it sounds like um, you don't hear so many Jews being called uh, Dunash nowadays. But it would be, it would be, uh, a proud Sephardi name to give to your son, as everyone is expecting. I would, I would propose Dunash as a name. It would be really cool. Uh, okay, <laughs> um, propose it to your spouse. Uh, so Dunash uh, studied uh, with Sadi Gaon in Baghdad, and then he came to um, to Cordoba, uh, and uh, which is basically culturally at the time the same, the same as as Morocco. It's really the same cultural uh, area at that point. Um, even uh, the Arabic that people spoke there was basically a form of Moroccan uh, Arabic. Uh, you see that, by the way, in in um, in some of the writings in Judeo-Arabic by Maimonides. He wrote a lot. He wrote some of it in Cairo, but he was a Moroccan. He was from Spain and uh, and had lived in Morocco, and so um, he writes sometimes. Uh, that's typically for Moroccan uh, dialects. Apologies. Are you referring to Darija, or was that? that not even? Or was that not even a language at that time? But Darija is the Moroccan word for dialect. So usually, when you say Darija, then it means Moroccan dialect. The local, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't know if it's called dialect. It, it, it he writes. He doesn't write Darija, but he uses a form in the imperfect, which is uh, in in Arabic, the the present or the future tense. Uh, when you speak in 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 Moroccan. When you um, speak the I form, you use the, the we form. So let's say, uh, I'm going to say it in Hebrew because more people know Hebrew. Let's say um, I write in Arabic, uh, in, Ara in Arabic is uh, aktub, but in, uh, in Moroccan you say naktub for I'm writing or I write, and yeah. we write as naktubu with a plural u at the end. So he does that here and there in his uh, writings. When he's clearly speaking, meaning I, and he writes we. And uh, that sounds like very lofty language, but it's really just Moroccan uh, standard. And in any case, um, forget about that. So he, he, goes, he goes there, and he adopts, he makes, um, yeah, he, 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 he makes, a, he designs a format for Hebrew poetry in which um, that you can apply it to, to, uh, to, to, to this, what I call Andalusian poetry. Uh, because why? Because it really starts really in El Andalus in Spain. 
for Hebrew at least. So you have to now, of course, uh, differentiate between long and short vowels in Hebrew. Now there are long and short, there used to be long and short vowels. Actually, there's a, a you have long vowels in Hebrew, short vowels, and super short vowels. For instance, the kamatz is usually ah, a long ah, and the patach is ah, short. The, you have um, e and e, but in, in some, at some point in the Hebrew, you, the, the, in Hebrew, these differentiations have, have disappeared. It is not um, in most areas of the Jewish world, at least. So, for instance, patach and kamatz, ah, ah uh, and ah, uh, are all pronounced as ah. Uh. The tzere and the segol are now in Israel both eh. Uh, that was probably uh, in Spain differently, different, but still there's no, was no difference between long and short. E and e were, were all pronounced as e. So, but the, so we had to do something else. There are also shup, super short vowels. So if you had ah, but with kamatz, Ah, with come and then you had the chatev patach. Ah, very short. It used to be just uh, almost like a shiva, almost like a silent. Those that um, would be um, that he treated like the short vowel. So only these on the left, these these ones. Now this is actually a wrong example that I made because most of these never appear under a, a bit. Only. The, the, the last three, um, this is here, Chatev Patach, Chatev Segol, and Chatev Kamets Chatuf, or Chatev Kamets, which is A, E, and O. They only appear under an Aleph, a Chet, a He, and a Ayin, never under a Beit. So, whatever. Why did I do this? I wasn't thinking. Why is this uh, the Shiva uh, could be either silent or like, uh, or moving, which means it sounds like e, uh, and then the u, if the beginning of a word is also a replacement of e. Uh, let's say if you have uh, the shiva before, uh, let's say w, in front of a word with a mem, so w medina becomes umdina. Uh, so this u is is like a, a adaptation of a shiva. In these cases, these forms. He treats as short vowels, and here the all the others as long. And now you can actually create the same kind of poetry, although it's a bit less natural, but it works, and, and it got really very popular. So, for instance, here is the first the, the, that we have written. It's a very uh, very famous one, the Rori Kra by Dunash Ibn Labrat. And this is in Hazaj, that's the example I showed you, short, long, 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 short, long, long, long. Now let's look closely at this poem. The, um, I have the red, the vowels in red are all short vowels. And therefore, these, these, these uh, syllables are short syllables. So it's every word has four here, every word has four syllables. The first one is short. The others are all long. Let's look at the first word, de, that is a shiva. So that is uh, now a short syllable. Roar, this is a, this is a uh, closed syllable. That's where it counts as long. Yik is also uh, a closed syllable because it ends with a consonant. It's also now considered a long syllable. And ra ends with a long vowel, is therefore also a long syllable. So we have three long syllables and one short. D, roar, yik, ra. Here too, le ben im bat. The blue is the uh, I did blue for the for the, the the rhyme. Those are the rhyming words, and it's not so spectacular because it's all but 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 me 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 right. Le ben im bat ve yin sorchem ke mo ba bat. Okay, why do I have this in green? Because this spells his name: dalet vav nun shin dunash. In every in every strophe, he writes his name, Dunash, Dunash, and then the next two strophes here, where is that? Also, here also, Dunash. And it's the same pattern. De Roch Pura, Betoch Botra, Begam Edom, 
this add-on is perhaps yeah that's a that's not a, a short okay asher gabra actually he said probably gabra because this would ruin the, the schedule now it's interesting there are different versions when people sing it uh, <clears throat> it could also be bavel that's either but adam is the older version um yes let's go back to the first there are different versions and as uh, people say oh ours is older ours is older but if you look if you really recognize the rhyme schedule you can actually detect which is the right one so just came to my mind, that's why. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have it uh, recorded somewhere. Um, yeah, it's true uh, that it is nicer, but it, I, I did the one that is faster, so I will not take too much time. But yeah. Um, mm. The thoughts arrive af Ibra, Shema Polibium Ekra, the Echochma, the Nashecha, the Hichetel Roshecha, the Sormitzvat Kudoshecha, Shemoshabat Kudosha. Ah, so what some people sing is the Af Vaivra and the V, Af Vaivra. The Vaivra, see? Yeah, 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 okay. So, uh, and that, 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 that is clearly not uh, in sync with the rhyme scheme. So you can see this is the probably the oldest version. Yeah. Okay, now um, there are love poems. From some of them, I, I have not uh, been able to find the Hebrew, but it's just some examples here. Um, maybe we'll do that next time. We'll go over the themes. Uh, it's about halfway the the slide, so we'll do that. Uh, do you agree, or you want to do a few more? I can do one love. Let's end with one love poem. In this time of trouble, we'll end with love. How is that? This was blessing for a wedding, and um, banish suffering and also wrath, and the mute will break into song. Guide us along the righteous path. And grant us the blessings of Aaron's son, sons. This was written for a, for a wedding. So, um, and of course, I, if only I had the Hebrew. I have some others with Hebrew, but some I don't have. It's just to, to show some themes. It's a love song, obviously a poem. But um, you can you can see that uh, you know, the blessing of Aaron's songs, sons. That is already, a, of course, a. a a hint to the, to the Bible. You have to know what that means. You have to know why Aaron's sons, and uh, all of you know that, that Aaron's are, Aaron, the Kohanim, are the ones to bless the, the people, and we know which son, which, which blessing it is. Um, but, so, it, it's a nice, uh, the righteous path is probably from the Psalms. There's many things from the Psalms. Mm -hmm. That's what I think it yeah. is, yeah. But I'm, I, that we can only talk about it really and know what, what, what it is uh, if, we knew, if we knew the Hebrew. Here, i do one more. And this is about wine versus Zion. Wine versus Zion. Frivolity versus piety. This is a wine song, but with a, with a, with, with a religious twist. We'll go to Abigail. Frivolity versus pietism. Drink, he said. Drink wine aged well in barrels. Drink, he said. Don't doze. Near henna beds and Abel. Ellos. 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 Near henna beds and ellos and myrrh mixed with rose. In pomegranate groves by grapevines and date palms, we'll sing our songs and psalms by tamarisks and rose. Each of the trees there grows, 
with branches and fine fruit, and all the birds their flute, their avian adagios. 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 Adagio is a is a, is a, is a, a, comp a classical type of classical composition, and it rhymes with grows and rows and those. Yeah. I will drink along the meadows, surrounded by carnations, with wine and jubilations. We'll drive away our sorrows. Uh, this is what you propose? How dare you think of wine? God's temple and his shrine are held by unclean foes. Are you so ill-advised to be an epicure? While well, we are now obscure, detested, and despised. Right. Everything ends with O's except for the last one. I couldn't find the... I, I, I made it rhyme, which is always like a little challenge. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't have O's at the end. But this sounds... Yeah, From I'm, what I'm language? Thinking. I'm sorry. I'm lost. What language? What language? Is this English? Oh, who wrote this? It's, uh... Uh, it was not originally in English. I don't have the Hebrew. I only found the translation. Uh, but, but it's about uh, the theme. So I this is uh, this is about okay, wine drinking. Okay. This is a whole the whole theme about wine drinking. We're gonna see more of them. Wine is like uh, becomes like enjoying sitting in the sun, in the shades, listening to birds. You you enjoy the good life, but how can we enjoy the good life? Jerusalem is in shambles, and uh, and it's and it's uh, it's occupied by Jews, by, not, by, 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 by Gentiles who have no right to it. And so we should not enjoy it. But he really puts the enjoyment in it. And everybody wants to sit in that, uh, in that vineyard and drink that wine. Because when you listen to that, it sounds just amazing. You smell uh, henna beds and aloes and roses and birds go and and sit on your shoulder and sing you a song like in Snow White. And then all of a sudden, well, we put in some religious stuff. You know, we have to be pious Jews. We can't, we can't be too much enjoying ourselves. We can't be too Sephardic. We have to also be, have a little bit Ashkenazi in ourselves to, um, to uh, ruin the mood and just think of the horrible things in this world, which are always, always there, of course. Yeah, I, I, look, this is a... This is one that I liked particularly because it has two uh, themes in it. It has the wine theme and it has the Zion theme as an opposition. But most of the wine uh, uh, poetry, and there are hundreds, I'm sure, uh, are just about wine and uh, not so much. Um, with no, I think the one I said was uh, Ibn Gvirol, I think. is. Uh, yeah, yeah, is but he's a lot uh, later. And I don't think I have that. But he wrote hundreds of poems and a lot of wine poems. So if yeah. you have the original, I... Yeah, I fine. have the original and I can you use it. To what? French. I have the original and I translate oh. to French if somebody's interested. Al Tomar, uh, 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 I'll send it to you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do the Hebrew and the English. It's nice. I have the English okay. and the French. <laughs> the Hebrew and the French, I mean. <laughs> so. um, what shall I do? Okay, I'll do one more and then we'll s call it uh, a class. Um, also, the, there was there is a, a poem by a woman, which is Dunash ibn Labrad's wife. She also wrote in Hazaj, a short syllable, long, 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 short, long, long, long. And she that, this was a, a poem written to her husband, who was uh, journeying. Um, and um, if we read the Hebrew, you can maybe detect the short and the long. So, ha, that is uh, with a khatef patach. Etc. Will her love recall his graceful doe? What is that? A doe, doe, a deer, a female deer. So a doe or a, or a, or a gazelle or a, is 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 very very often used as a code word for a beloved. Um, cradling her only son while left alone. Will her love, meaning will Dunash, 
recall his graceful doe. Will he, is he thinking about me at all? I'm his graceful doe. I'm his, his, his loving wife. And I'm cradling her only son and his only son left alone. Is, he's having fun with his poetry in faraway lands. And I am here babysitting. Who's, he, who set his right hand seal on her left hand. He gave her when he left a ring. Did she not place on his arm her precious stone? They exchanged rings. So um, to, uh, to, um, as a token of uh, loyalty and faithfulness. That day she made a safekeep of his cloak and he made hers a safekeep of his own. They also exchanged not just jewelry, but also clothing. Would he remain in any of the land of Spain if her prince had taken half his lover's throne? Would he have stayed in Spain? Meaning, could she have done anything to keep him there by giving him... To keep, yeah, him, to give uh, him uh, to Yeah. Probably, yeah. Okay. So it's a... So she was into poetry too. And, and I guess this is... The oh, way she knows the Bible really well. She yeah. knows the Bible really well. The Sam Khotami we know is... Is uh, is the Shira Shiri, yeah, um, right, and right. Uh, even some Eliezer and Rivka in there too, with the stones and stuff put on her hand and stuff, and the dough, of course, the dough is is totally from from that. So yeah, so um, she knew how to get to his uh, to his heart by by poetry. That was how he got excited, I guess. That was his thing. Okay, um, we'll stop here. We'll uh, continue with an illusion poetry, and this is uh, quite. Quite interesting stuff. <laughs> 